Welcome to LOA Today. I'm Walt Thiessen. With me today is longtime listener, poet laureate, and Taya master, Anne-Marie Young. This is your Daily Dose of Happy. We are so happy you decided to join us today. And Anne-Marie, uh, we're, we're actually going to be discussing a topic today that we've talked about on, in the past year on, on the program years ago. It's been a long time since we've addressed the topic of the sacred feminine. I mean, like a long, long time. So it's kind of appropriate that our guest today, uh, Lauren LaDuke, is somebody who is an expert in that because that's what she does. She helps people, she helps women to find that within themselves. So this is kind of an exciting day, and I'm sure it's going to be true for, I mean, the, the majority of our audience is female, so I think the majority of the audience is going to love it. But I'll tell you what, if you're male, pay attention anyway. Because here's an interesting fact. We all have feminine in us. We also have all, ma- all have masculine in us. So we can all learn from all this stuff. It's pretty cool. How are you doing? We we missed you last week. Oh, thank you. I, I was too busy having fun. Well, that's a good thing. We like that. Yeah. We're all about the fun <laughs> around here. But it's great to have you back. And uh, Lauren, thank you for uh, joining us from uh, Kansas City, Missouri. I, it's been, I have actually been to Kansas City. It's been a long time since I've been there. But uh, yeah, that, 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 if, you, if you like the Midwest, like that's the best city to be in, I think. Yeah. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. Um, and I agree. Best city. And I have to say your theme song just made me so happy. <laughs> cool. I love that. That's great. Yeah, well, especially yeah. since I wrote it, I created it. So I appreciate it. Really? That yeah. That is amazing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I figured I'd put the talent to work, you know, to see what I could do with it. But you got to tell us a little bit about your background and how you got into this whole sacred feminine thing. Cause I'm sure there's a nice, interesting and Probably not only is it an interesting story, usually with these things, there's something that kind of led to it, some sort of trigger that led to it. I'm kind of curious to know what that trigger is. Sure. Um, I don't know if there's one trigger, but I'll definitely go through some of my story for sure and how this connection has unfolded for me. So as you said, I grew up in Kansas City, Missouri. And if you are from the U.S., you know that I'm in the Bible Belt. Oh, yes. So- <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Oh, yes. <laughs> very much so, right? Very much so, um, yes. And we live in the city now. It's very um, diverse as far as belief systems. But what I grew up in in the suburbs of KC was definitely very much that. So I grew up in the evangelical churches. That was really all I knew about. And I had this very, um, I wouldn't say I had a narrow idea of what God was. But I had a more like vast experience, if that makes sense. So how I connected, how I felt in my body, the joy that I would receive from it, um, all were so much bigger than this like kind of narrow idea of the man in the sky, um, and, and all the other story that, that comes along with Christianity. So I really started questioning things, uh, as a teenager, as many people do. And within the church, just wasn't really finding the type of answers that I was looking for. I think there was just a lot going on at the time where my mind was expanding really fast and I was also kind of crashing and burning. So I was this like high achieving kid who wanted to be the good girl, wanted to be perfect, wanted to like fit into all all the societal standards. And I think I just had this profound realization that I just wasn't that. And in the process, I developed a really difficult eating disorder. And I think, yeah, in my healing from that, which took a good 10 years, I really was on this like big journey of self-discovery and figuring out my own relationship to spirituality, if I even had one, and what I believed, who I was, what I was good at, what I was meant to be here for, all the big questions, right, that come up. And I realized they couldn't be answered by how I had grown up. I know that that religion serves a lot of people, so I'm not here to like bash anyone. I'm really just talking about my own particular experience in just wanting something that felt authentic to me, I think, and Mm -hmm. something that made sense and something really outside of like the dogma that I was exposed to because it just didn't really sit right with me. It felt like it should be an individual journey and I shouldn't just follow rules because they're there. Um, it needs to make sense to me, right? I've always had that like bit of rebelliousness in me, even when trying to like fit into that good girl mode. So it was in that healing that I was exposed to yoga and yoga is still like very much one of the loves of my life. Um, I 
took my first class in the hospital uh, while I was receiving inpatient treatment at age 17. And wow. then I took classes here. Yeah, yeah. So it was a profound experience for me to connect with my body and my breath in that way and to just connect with calm, I think, in a way mm-hmm. I hadn't before. And to just have space. It wasn't praying. It was just connecting in right. a more open way. So I really loved that and continued my practice sporadically. It was a, I'm 39 now. So it was a little bit different time where you can't just pull up YouTube and like find hundreds or thousands or millions of yoga <laughs> classes. I had like two VHS tapes that I would practice with. Right. Uh, and then I had more experiences that opened me up more. One was uh, not consciously done, but psychedelics as like an early, early 20s person and mm-hmm. really like feeling what it feels like to be here now. Mm-hmm. Um, in that experience, I was interested in Reiki. I was just meeting a lot of people and hearing a lot of different stories and seeing how a lot of other people around the world lived. Um, so... I'm trying to think like when the sacred feminine popped up for me. I did Reiki first and really learned about the chakras, which are a huge um, educational tool for me now and a, a personal tool for sure. Um, and actually, the first time I ever really connected with a goddess was I had related a ton of student debt, uh, a medical debt, and I was feeling pretty hopeless. Mm-hmm. There was a sort of block between me and money and it wasn't enough just to like sit down and look at a spreadsheet or something like that. I knew there was a lot of internal healing to do, but I was willing to try pretty much anything. And YouTube was around at this point, I think through my (laughs) twenties, and I found a chant to the goddess Lakshmi and I didn't really know anything about it, but I was like, Hey, I'm willing to try pretty much anything at this point. So I started chanting regularly to Lakshmi and feeling like so connected to her Mm. and While I had heard of other uh, religions, ancient and still practiced, that had goddess worship within them, I hadn't personally connected with that. And suddenly I was able to see myself more in the divine and the divine more in me, just seeing it in this more feminine form. It was really eye-opening to me. Um, I was able to like really deeply study yoga later on. And now I've been a yoga teacher for 10 years and have a yoga studio and started really expanding the different, uh, my different knowledge of the different goddesses and doing embodiment practices and chanting around them and just learning more and more. And then in the last few years, while I love the different goddesses from different traditions and they really show like that there is so so much complexity to feminine energy. It's not just something that's soft and sweet and, and uh, subservient. (laughs) I'll say it's, it's, you know, Kali, she is the destroyer and Durga is a warrior and Saraswati is a muse and an artist and a teacher. And Lakshmi is the goddess of abundance. And there's just uh, so many different, different aspects to the goddess. And what I started connecting to um, more deeply is more of like my own personal sacred feminine. So while I love, let's, let's, let's it, define that too, because I mean, there, there are a lot of different definitions. A lot of people have different ways of, of feeling it, expressing it and so forth. When you think of that phrase, sacred feminine, what, mm-hmm. what comes out for you? Well, I love what you said at the beginning, which is it's not male or female. These are energies that we all with, have within us. Mm-hmm. And as human beings, things aren't black and white. They just aren't. It's easy to categorize (laughs) things like that, but it's just really not how life works in my opinion Mm. and experience. So we hold these energies within us and we're constantly working with them to to balance or to cultivate one of more or the other, whatever we need at the time. And many of the ancient practices like through Hatha Yoga and Tantra were all about balancing the masculine and feminine. So what that means Masculine is uh, solar energy. It's penetrating. It's linear. It's more structured. Um, and then feminine energy is more wild, more flowing, lunar energy. It's cyclical. It's cool. It's receptive. Um, you might think of like the yin and yang. If people aren't mm-hmm. familiar with masculine and feminine, it's a very similar mm-hmm. concept. And it's similar in that there's masculine in the feminine and feminine in the masculine, yeah. like I'm talking about. Nothing's really black and white. Um, 
So in my opinion, this culture that many of us grow up in, almost everywhere in the world, the masculine is just more per- pervasive. Um, things are more linear. You're meant to show up to work every single day in exactly the same way, for instance. Um, men have held more power and influence for a long time, uh, whereas women and femmes and queer people have not. And there are certain qualities that I would consider more feminine that are looked down upon rather than uh, embraced and cultivated within men, women, and, and anywhere in between. So for me, embracing the sacred feminine was really about kind of opening myself up to all of the different aspects of who I am and like loving on that. Mm-hmm. So loving my sensitivity, for instance, loving that I don't show up the same every day. My body wasn't made to do that. My body's made to, to connect to the moon <laughs> and, and go with that cycle. Um, learning to even love like the anger that can come up in the feminine, especially since I've become a mom, like there's that mama bear (laughs) energy that comes up for sure. Uh, But those are just a few examples of things I just didn't, I just wasn't sure like how I fit in before to society. And once I started like working with these different qualities, I realized that they're sacred and they're something that I can um, use as like a superpower. The fact that I don't show up every day the same can be a superpower if I understand how my body and hormones are working and and how the moon is working. The fact that I'm sensitive doesn't mean that I need to feel beaten down by life or like boxed in to live my life in a specific way. It's something that I can love on and cultivate. And now I use for my career as a yoga teacher and as a writer and, and as an intuitive as well. Um, so that's kind of a, a long-winded synopsis yeah. of masculine and feminine to me, but there are these energies that live within us. Um, and I think for many, many people, the feminine is quite suppressed. Um, so as we love on and work on these different qualities of the feminine, just like I, I in my journey did, we're able to find the sense of wholeness of like, oh, there are all these different parts of me and they're all okay. <laughs> Yeah, not yeah. To be shoved down or, or looked down upon. When when you mentioned the the mama energy or the mama bear energy, the first thought that came to my mind is, yeah, don't cross mama bear. Not a good <laughs> idea. <laughs> not if you value your life. <laughs> don't, <laughs> don't. Right, it's Amory, a am force you don't. Oh no, it's a force you don't want to mess with. Trust me. <laughs> <laughs> Anne Marie, you're a mama too. <laughs> I am a mama too. <laughs> Yeah, I felt that uh, I didn't feel very safe or comfortable connecting with my anger, actually, really until I became a mom. Um, in my family, uh, I, I love my parents, but my dad was definitely like the dominating one. We lived within like the Christian structure of the man is the head of the household and man is the um, spiritual leader of the family even. And he was very quick to anger. And I felt my job was to either hide from that or placate it, um, kind of fawning, if you will, befriending the bear. <laughs> um, so it was a quality that I was afraid to really embrace within myself until later in life uh, because it felt so out of control and destructive. But what I see from looking at the goddesses and looking within the goddess of myself, it's, it's an energy And it's an emotion. No emotions are wrong. And if we can be conscious about it, it can be transmuted or transformed into sacred action rather than just this destructive force. And I think that's a very like specific feminine quality of anger. Mm -hmm. And I think once you find the appreciation of those emotions and the beauty of those emotions, it takes away the power that those emotions have over you, doesn't it? So I was very calm when I became a, became a mother and it was, it calmed me down and it, all I felt was love. It was amazing. But as I've got older and I'm hitting menopause and stuff, that anger now comes up and it's, it's trying to find that appreciation. Okay. Your body's changing and it's a whole cycle and you're, it's doing what you want. And it's taken away the power of the fear of losing my temper and giving you different ways of dealing with it. So I, I think that appreciation for these things is quite crucial. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I love what you bring up about like this particular period of your life, because I was talking about more like the the menstrual cycle, which doesn't carry through the entirety uh, of a woman's life. But yeah, our hormones are constantly changing throughout our lives. And I do think like the the middle age is the archetype of like the wild woman. That's another, (laughs) (laughs) which she often gets left out, right? We talk about like maiden, mother and crone, but there's also this like wild woman who seems to appear around like mid forties. And, and older and she can be this huge catalyst for change with the mm. sacred anger if it's harnessed right yes. instead mm. of just raging <laughs> without purpose <laughs> absolutely i fully agree I'm thinking also about the, the mama bear metaphor some more because where I, li- I live in, uh, we were talking about this before we got started, but I live in Simsbury, Connecticut, which is northwest of Hartford, Connecticut. And we have the largest number of bear population sightings of anywhere in Connecticut. And I think perhaps even in New England, we have lots of bear coming through our area and it's fine. I mean, they're not, they're not grizzly. So they're not, they're, they're the they're so-called brown bear and you don't want to mess with them, but they'll, they'll pretty much leave you alone and so on and so forth. It's not quite the same risk factor as dealing with a grizzly that you'd run into out in the West. Um, but there are plenty of them. We have a, uh, I, I run a gardening service, gardening and maintenance business. And we have a customer who told us one time about how there was a, a mama bear and a male, a, a, a single male, I believe. Uh, and the mama had a cub and they were basically challenging each other to a fight in her yard, right? In like, there, there are like two trees and there are these two bears and, and you, the, the mama bear was basically protecting the cub. The, the male bear was about 20% bigger than the mama bear, but you wouldn't know it because that bear was terrified of that mama bear. Yeah. And I say that, oh, yeah. absolutely, t- but for good reason. I mean, the, the <laughs> you know, the, the cliches about you don't mess with mama bear really do come from nature. You do not mess. Mm-hmm. If, you, if you're anywhere near a bear and you can see a cub, the first thing you do is stop because you, you don't want to go anywhere near that situation. And that male bear was learning the hard way. You don't do that. But he was, he was getting the worst of that fight. He really was. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was just incredible. And loud too, but that's another point. Um, but I bring this up, um, because I, I think it's more than just a metaphor. There, yes, we do live in a, a male dominated society. For those who are the dominant males, I would advise you to rethink because I believe that we, we can learn a lot from that male bear who realized, you know, you really don't want to mess with a mama bear. You don't really want to try to dominate a, male, a mama bear. If you do, you're setting yourself up. You're setting yourself up for trouble. So that now that's the negative side of the energy, but nevertheless, I think it's an important one. It's important to recognize that. Well, and if you think about it, that bear is she's protecting life, right? That's there's right. righteousness. Yeah. There's righteousness in that yeah. anger. Um, it's not just for competition. It's for right. you know the perpetuation of that's the right. life cycle. And yeah. so I think that that anger comes for for a reason and we can use it as protect protectresses not only of of children but of the earth itself um and of whatever is worth preserving and nurturing yeah. you know nurturing isn't just isn't just lovey-dovey <laughs> it's it's bringing in whatever energy is needed at the moment and i always see it as that 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 mama bear and when she's doing that she's not just protecting her young she's protecting their future and their children's future by yeah. passing on that power and those values mm. yeah i absolutely pass, agree with that when you pass on those values you're also um not, not just passing on values you're, you're passing along a piece of who you are aren't you i mean you, you're basically yeah. sharing your essence that's what the energy is all about the energy is your essence so in, in the transmission of that essence, you are also uh, simultaneously transmitting the perpetuation of the species. The two are going hand in hand. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think not only that, but the, like that being's dharma or purpose, right? Like we're, we're born with these, these qualities that make us special and that we're meant to like usher into this world, I think to create beautiful change and, by protecting our babies, we're giving them the space to grow up and 
uh, really like unleash that <laughs> on the world mm. just by, by sharing their frequency and, and being themselves. So for me, like I've learned so much from being a mom and uh, my daughter is almost three. So we still have a long way to go, but the prayer I say every night is just like, please let me be the mother she needs because I don't want to, I don't want to stomp on some of the qualities that she has that are kind of difficult to deal with now. Um, I want those to be nurtured so that she's able to like do her job in this world, whatever that might be. So it's, it's hard, you know, with a really headstrong three-year-old. <laughs> yes, I totally get that. I always, I always say that. I really want you to have these values and I really want you to have this, but I just don't want you to have it with me. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Once again, don't mess with mama bear. Not a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> but there's also, uh, I mean, when we're talking about energies and that's really what, what's at the, the root of this idea of the sacred feminine, we're talking about energies. When, when we're talking about energies, we're, we're also, like we were mentioning before, we're talking about human energies or even, uh, animal kingdom energies that, that, that cross gender lines. Um, and that can be a source of confusion. So for instance, if, Lauren, if you're talking to uh, a group of men, for instance, and, and you're trying to explain to them where sacred feminine comes in for them, first of all, you probably get a lot of resistance on that. Like, oh yeah, I'm not going to listen to this thing. But if you can actually get them to listen for a moment, what do you say to them? Yeah. Well, I do work with mostly women, but I do have, I do have male students at my yoga studio. And I think I just, I start getting technical with it. You know, like how does this energy anatomy work within the system? Because I think being able to visualize it, um, allows us to see a little bit better, like how it resides within us. So if you don't mind, I'll explain a little bit. Like, not at all. Okay. So, uh, in the yogic body, there are these energy highways called nadis and they're like channels of energy that go all through the physical body through the aura and everywhere that one intersects with another becomes a chakra and a chakra or chakra is a whirling vortex of energy so it's like everywhere th these intersect we get this swirling energy okay so there are three major nadis or highways that run along the spine the middle one is called Shashumna. There's one that runs to the right of it, which is kind of the masculine channel, uh, which is called Pingala. There's one to the left of it that is the more feminine channel, which is called Ida. And as these swirl and intersect around Shashumna, we create the seven major chakras. So the seven major chakras are these zones in the body that really encompass our humanity. They're like little, I think of like a filing system of like these different aspects of what makes us who we are. And they, these different aspects live within the different chakras. So for instance, the root chakra, which is at the base of the spine, really encompasses like our foundation, our physical safety, um, our inner child, our ancestry, uh, our financial stability, everything that, uh, our body, everything that's really like about survival. And within that, there are both masculine and feminine energies. And those reside within each of these major chakra points. And sometimes they can be out of balance. Um, and sometimes they're balanced. They're, they're not fixed. So there's something that we can constantly work on. Uh, and this is actually when we talk about my book, the system I use to kind of, uh, connect with, with the feminine energy through the chakras. Um, so I would explain it that way and just that there are these kind of opposing energies that live within us and Feminine doesn't mean female, although I do think that there are certain aspects of it that might be more easily accessed by women. Um, one, because of our bodies and hormonal systems, but two, because some things that we're socialized with are acceptable in women that aren't as acceptable in men, right? So, for instance, feeling big emotions, right? People kind of think that that's a feminine thing, that it's okay for women to do, although well, we might call them crazy and hysterical every once in a while, <laughs> uh, but for men that they need to like have that under control. And we've all seen how that backfires over and over and over again. Oh, yeah. the, the more emotions are pushed down, the more they come out in really unsavory and sometimes violent ways, uh, whether that be internally or externally. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so by embracing these different aspects of ourselves, we're able to live in a way that just feels better, that feels more fully expressed, where things are flowing the way that they need to, and we're, where we're not really suppressing anything. So did that answer the question? I feel like I kind of started ranting. <laughs> Actually, you, you, you gave one of the most in-depth descriptions of the chakra system that I've heard. I mean, we've had a lot of people describe it, and you gave us a level of detail that we've never encountered before. So thank you for that. That was really great. Thank you. That's the yoga teacher and yoga teacher trainer in me for sure. I'm, I'm yeah. used to teaching these concepts. Um, but yeah, totally accessed within both men and women. I would also add that we have so much familial, ancestral, societal, cultural programming, religious programming too, like I was talking about earlier on in my own experience. And that can shape our idea of who we think we are and how we are supposed to be. So really by tuning into our energy and by embracing these opposing or uh, polar energies, we're able to start shedding some of that and really getting to the heart and the core of who we truly are, which is a very like grounded way to live. Mm. Yeah. And you mentioned your book. We haven't actually mentioned the title yet, but it's Embody Your Inner Goddess, A Guided Journey to Radical Wholeness, um, which I kind of, I, I mean, authors often spend a lot of time on their titles. And I get the feeling that you really spend a lot of time on this title. Like this title was very carefully crafted to express what you're trying to express. Am I wrong about that? Yeah. I mean, I, honestly, I don't know how much thought went into it <laughs> as far as like time and, and energy, but it does seem to fit exactly what this book is meant for. So it's very interactive and it is meant to take the reader on a journey. I share my own journey, but also facilitate one for the reader and it's very interactive. So they're able to not only read these daily readings that are a blend of my story and uh, just channeled writings and yogic philosophy, um, but there's an opportunity to reflect on each one. So that's uh, journaling, answering questions about like your own story, your own relationship with these different like aspects of the chakras uh, and then embodiment practices every day. And those are actually like action steps to feel what it's like to work with these, these particular energies or concepts. So it starts at the root chakra, goes all the way to the crown. So I won't, say it's an easy journey to take, but it's absolutely worthwhile and it's thorough. And when it, you talked about the intention of the title, uh, and it's a guided journey to radical wholeness as the, the subtitle, the secret I think of that is everyone is already whole. That's really like the whole point. Mm -hmm. So this isn't necessarily like a self-improvement journey. It's more like self-acceptance and loving and like, um, remembering who we truly are, which is this divine essence, which can only be whole. Uh, it's whole by its nature. And it's easy to forget over and over that that's who we are. So. I find that most people, when, they're, when they write, they are writing to a particular individual or a persona or avatar. And, and I'm curious, what what did you have in mind? Who, who was the person you had in mind? Or what was the kind of person you had in mind when you were writing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say if there was an avatar, it would be a younger version of myself, for sure. Mm -hmm. Somebody who could have really used this kind of encouragement and knowledge. And it took me a long time, you know, to unearth all of it. Mm. Um, but I also know so many women, young and old. Uh, and, and it's not just for women, although I'd say it is geared a bit more toward them. But but people who walk around feeling like there's something wrong with them, like they have to apologize for who they are. Yeah. And this is a lot of strong encouragement to not do that anymore. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to, know, to know that you're okay and that like you're not like uh, in the more human sense. None of us are perfect. We're not. And that's not what this is about. Mm -hmm. It's about allowing for these different aspects of our humanity to to be seen and heard and nurtured and then connecting with the divine within us. Um, so yeah, definitely my younger self who was very, very lost. So a guided journey would have been most welcome. <laughs> Emory, when she was describing that your head was not nodding very vigorously. So you were, you were identifying with that. 
Yeah, and I was just also thinking, you know, when you're at school, you learn biology and how the inside of the body works. Wouldn't it be fantastic if we understood the energy and stuff around around our body and the impact that could make to our lives? Wouldn't it be good if we learned that early on? That would be something. <laughs> that, that would be that would be groundbreaking. Is what that would be. I agree. It would be it would be absolutely amazing. And when I teach about the energy body. Something I say is it's totally okay if you don't believe in it. Mm-hmm. Um, because I do think it's hard. like we learn about biology and we can look with our eyes and hear with our ears and taste with our taste. Like we can use our senses to see like, yes, this is true. Mm-hmm. But with the energy body, it's more felt. And while I personally believe in it, I think since it is this very like systematic kind of organizational system for what makes us, 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 um, that whether or not you truly believe in it, it's still something that you can absolutely work with. Mm-hmm. It's certainly something that science is still coming to terms with. I mean, science does recognize much more today than even 10 years ago that we are beings of energy. Um, they, they don't quite express it in those terms, but that's, that's largely the direction that science is headed. Um, there's also a lot of, um, a lot of road to be traveled. Yeah. Let's put it that way. Um, so they, they aren't quite there. Um, in terms of a total understanding, but nevertheless, it's heading that direction. So, I mean, p- people are going to, whether, whether they want to think about an energy body or not, or however terminology they want to use, whether they want to think about it or not, it's going to be coming into their lives because our society is moving in that direction. Uh, mm-hmm. In fact, we've had many guests here on the program talking about how there's, a, there's this global energy raising and this enlightenment period and so on that's going on. And, and I have to say, I've, I've, um, observed it as well. Um, it's, it's, I mean, it's easy to get caught up in all of the craziness that goes on. There's a lot of uh, angst, a lot of dissension, a lot of, uh, you know, oh my goodness, the world coming to the end kind of, of, of fears and so forth. But boy, if you can look past that for a moment, there's just so much evidence that there, there is an energetic shift going on. So, um, one of my first, uh, interviews, I, I've been doing the show 11 years, Lauren, one of my first interviews back in 2012 was with a uh, comedian who wrote a book called Get Your Shift Together. And I thought it was a perfect title to describe exactly what we're talking about here. Because when you're getting shift together, you're really getting used to that shift in energy that's going on across the globe. Yeah, I, I agree. First of all, 11 years, that's so amazing. And uh, <laughs> just really, really commend you for that. Um, you're definitely an, an early, early pioneer <laughs> in, this, <laughs> in this world for sure. Um, but yeah, I think that, I think for spiritual people, it's really important. Well, for everyone, but for spiritual people, it's really important to be discerning, right? I think that we can meditate and feel and know that there's this like, yeah, raising of the vibration that's happening right now. I, I truly believe like that's why this book was, was downloaded through me, which is kind of how it happened. The idea of it came all at once, um, because I do think embracing the sacred feminine is one of the key pieces to raising the the vibration of humanity Mm -hmm. and of the earth. Um, But let's be discerning about, about history, for instance, like it seems like the world is so crazy and in so many ways it is, but we have never had this kind of access to information. Humans weren't weren't meant to know (laughs) everything (laughs) going on in the world all at once. It can feel really overwhelming. And I think that, I don't personally subscribe to any of the like doomsday thought or dogma to me. Like that's very reflective of the religion that I grew up in. And it's one of Mm -hmm. the things I really disliked about it was all of the talk about the end of the world and preparing Mm -hmm. for that. I'm like, what can we do now to make Mm -hmm. the world a better place? How do we create heaven on earth now? Yeah. Yeah. And, and you expressed in one of the uh, profiles I saw about you, <clears throat> excuse me, you expressed the idea that that is actually achievable. Talk about that a bit. Why, why do you think it's achievable? I think it is. I mean, I think if we can have a global shift into patriarchy, we can certainly take a global <laughs> shift in, into more balance. I, I don't want to say matriarchy because it's not that. It's more just like, embracing ourselves and each other as souls, right? And and being more respectful of the earth and creating systems and structures that nurture us rather than, than destroy us. Um, 
And it's one of those things where I think it works on the microcosmic level and the macrocosmic. So yes, do these systems and structures need to change? Absolutely. Is that something I can do? Um, you know, in, in my lifetime, no, I can't do that. Like systems are made up of many, many people as we're manifesting. We are co-creating, right? It takes a lot of people to do these things, but we can also look at ourselves on the individual level and balance these energies out. And I think as we are this microcosm of the macrocosm, we are creating a different frequency on earth. So the more people that individually awaken or we can individually awaken like within communities, the more of a ripple effect that it's going to have. I don't personally think it's something that's going to happen overnight. I don't, I don't think that's a realistic expectation, but I do think it's something that can happen over time. So for me, for instance, in explaining these energies and helping people love themselves more, in helping people embrace these uh, parts of themselves that have been suppressed um, through for a long time, um, that's going to awaken different things within them. So as they kind of click into their own dharmas or purposes, then we all do work together to create this new earth that we talk about, right? Um So it can be frustrating, like when you're working on yourself to see other people like who seem so asleep, but everyone is on their own journey. And this is something that's probably going to take some time. So I think focusing on your corner of the world, uh, your backyard, however big or small it might be metaphorically, Mm -hmm. is the way to get started. Yeah, sure. And sure. actually, as you were talking, I was also thinking about uh, somebody that Anne Marie knows real well, um, a gentleman named David Strickle, who has uh, been a, a co-host on the show at times. He's been a guest many times. In fact, Anne Marie, last week he was on the show with me when you weren't here, which was kind of yes, sad. Yes, I David. know. I missed yeah. it. I was gutted. So that was, that, but uh, we had a great conversation. And David, um, David's also a channeler, and he channels uh, similar to the way Esther Hicks channels Abraham. He channels the stream of David, um, although he's now to the point where he, he he's kind of left the, the trans channeling behind. So he's kind of well, live channeling as as he's talking now. But um, I remember a number number of years ago he would talk he, mostly in trans channel mode. Um, he would talk about the um, the way that our our institutions are kind of going through a slow motion crumble. So for instance, the world of politics with all the dissension that goes on in politics, the the general faith in politics is eroding over time. Um, And many of our institutions are going through a similar kind of thing. Well, when you have major institutions going through those kind of changes, you know, nature does abhor a vacuum. So something is going to fill the gap. Something's going to fill in. And we don't always necessarily see what that thing is going to be as it's happening. We usually only see it about 20 years after the fact. And we look back and say, oh, look what just happened. Uh, but, you know, it does happen. It fills in. So to me, that's one of the best ways I think about um, what you were mentioning. That is, you, know, you, you work in your own little neighborhood. You, you work on your, your stuff. You, you try to help influence other people in your sphere. That's what fills in the gaps. That's, that becomes the mechanism, so to speak. Uh, for how these new energies enter society. And I, I've seen it. One of the ways I've seen it, I remember I started this podcast um, in 2012 because I was in a really difficult place financially. And uh, I had heard about law of attraction. I wanted to learn it more. So I, I started the show to get some experts on and explain it to me and so forth. And it worked out great. They, they helped me figure out what was going on with me. And it just turned into a thing that I love doing. One of the things I've noticed since then is at the time, if you mention the words law of attraction, first of all, most people you, you would say it to would have this blank look on their faces. If they did know about it at all, there was usually a negative stigma attached to it. Today, people come onto the program who have, you know, all, they come from all walks of life. They have all kinds of different career paths. No, almost none of them have, no, that's not true. There, there are many of them who have almost no, um, uh, involvement with law of attraction teaching. And yet they know about it. And they feel good about it. And they say, yeah, oh, yeah, I've been reading about that. I learned about that and so forth. Mm. Completely different attitude 11 years later. Mm. What caused it? (laughs) Well, what caused it is it starts seeping in through the cracks. But, Lauren, I don't know about you. This just be my personal observation. But I have noticed children nowadays are just powerful machines. Things that would have broken me as a child 
my kids are like, yeah. You know, they <laughs> just seem like a just a 10 ton truck of courage and power. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if you see that in your daughter or other children that you interact, but I just, I just see the difference of the children from when I was a child mm-hmm. to the kids nowadays. And it's, it's beautiful. Yeah, I definitely see that. And I just, I hope that you see your own role in that too, because I think yes. that, you know, our, our generation has had a difficult task, I think, which is to heal ourselves while raising our children and to like really embrace this new paradigm, uh, especially through parenting. Like we get to, we get to create these little mini atmospheres, right? Like you're talking about like the, the yard or your own little slice of the world. Yes. Like we get to create uh, maybe a more feminine energy embracing household, meaning like, you know, we were talking earlier on about some of the qualities that are difficult, but we've created like a table for it, for the children to be able to speak their minds, which is probably not something that you might have been able to do as a child or me. Um, so I think that we are given this pretty difficult task to like rewrite our own programming essentially um, so that we can parent in a really healthy way rather than just passing on mm-hmm. what we learned yeah. and from our own conditioning and programming. So the, the kids these days, I do think they're coming in with like these new frequencies. I think they're really like high vibrational souls, but we're the ones tasked to, to birth and raise them. Right. Yeah. Um, which is its own tremendous amount of work and love. Just <laughs> 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 Such a, a beautiful thing. Yeah. They're amazing kids. And I think just looking at them, that there's our proof yeah. right, mm-hmm. of, of raising the vibration. There. That's a pattern that's been yeah. going on for, for a long time, too. The succeeding generations are always more um, spiritually advanced, more knowledgeable. Um, basically, they, they have more to work with than the previous generation had, which had more than the previous generation before that and so forth. It just, it's like this ongoing expansion of understanding all it is. That's true. I suppose like 100, 150 years ago, children must be seen and not heard. Well, 50 years ago, you don't have to go that far back. <laughs> oh, I was always heard. I was right. <laughs> Which shows you how exceptional you are. <laughs> but it'd be interesting to see what it's going to be like another 150 years. Not that I plan on being mm. around, but, you know, if, if that is the cycle, you know, from going from nothing to these little powerhouses. It'd be interesting to watch. Yeah, well, we get to see it as we're going along, too. I mean, yeah. that, that's really what Lauren was talking about. You get to see sure. how this stuff plays out just by bringing mm-hmm. these little people into the world and watching them turn into amazing beings. I'm always intrigued by the – by. They're, they're always in, – in every society, in every social situation, they're always the naysayers and the critics and so forth. Um, I, I'm always amused by the ones who criticize – you know, they're, they're the older generation, often my generation. I'm in the baby boomer. You know, criticizing the younger ones, all these, you know, these kids today, they have no appreciation for this, that, and the other thing. And I say to myself, are you talking about the same kids I am? I mean, seriously, <laughs> who are we looking at here? Because I'm not seeing the same thing you're seeing. <laughs> but that is fairly prevalent. And yet, I also see th- – this is the part that gets me excited – for my generation because I see more and more of my generation waking up to what actually is going on. You know, there's a lot that there's lots of, of judgmentalism that goes on, but the judgmentalism is shrinking. And, and I get excited by that. I feel like, yeah, well, Hey, I guess even the boomers can learn something. That's cool. <laughs> <laughs> but Lauren, when you're working with your, your clients, I mean, you mentioned that your clients are, are mainly female. Um, talk about what it is that, they're most often looking for from you. Like if you, you, we talked about the avatar before. If your avatar of your typical um, client comes to you, comes to your mind, what's that avatar looking for? What's that person looking for um, when she works with you? Yeah, they're usually looking for more clarity on something. So usually working one-on-one with people outside of yoga, I'm doing kind of um, like intuitive readings and mentorship. So for my intuitive readings, I connect with that person's inner goddess. So what I see is like the energy of this sacred feminine within them. And then I look at their different chakras 
and the, the, their goddess assists me to kind of figure out what's going on in these different areas. I will say though, most of the time, these women deep down know what's up. Mm. They know it's true. It just can feel very validating and supportive to have someone outside of yourself who's also able to, to see, feel, hear, know the same thing. So there are usually all different, there are so many different reasons that someone might get a reading. Uh, they need clarity on something. They just want to feel a little bit more connected to themselves. They might want to be more connected to their spirituality. They might want to know, like, what path do I take? Um, so those are all different, different situations that might bring someone to me. But truly, even though I'm using my intuition, it's really my greatest wish to help connect them to their own intuition. So, and, and I consider that like their inner goddess so that they have this internal guidance system and compass that they can follow. Sometimes it's just hard to hear through all the noise. Yeah. I like that phrase. It's hard to hear throughout the noise. It's a very good way of describing it. Um, I just know I, I'm thinking about the years I was doing this program and for years I would listen to people talk about that connection and so forth. And I, I'd, I'd say, Oh yeah. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And meanwhile, deep inside I'm saying, well, I don't know where that connection is. I have no idea. I mean, <laughs> well, I, I, I hope it'll show up at some point because I really don't know where it is. And then one day I realized that I did know where it was. Um, the way I expressed it was it was always so constant and so quiet. And so it, it, it never changed that I kind of ignored it because we pay attention to things that you know vary, that, that shift and so forth. And it never shifted, it never changed. And when I finally realized that that's what, it, what everybody was talking about, I said, Oh, Oh, okay. I didn't, you know, th that's a thing. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, I know him. Um, yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I, I, what I tell, clients is that your inner voice or your intuition is a quiet voice and it's always kind and it's always loving. And yeah, it can be really hard to hear that through all of the other stuff that's going through our mind all the time, all of what's going on in the body. Um, so I think having a lot of different, um, Practices that help create more space and ease through the body and mind help us, help us feel more in touch with that inner voice. Another way to get in touch with it is to not listen to it and see how things go until you finally listen. <laughs> well, that's most of my life you're describing there. I just don't understand that. Do you know, I, I once actually employed somebody because in an interview they said, Oh, I trust my gut. And I was like, perfect, because you just know that person's in tune. Mm -hmm. And it was a very, we were dealing with people's emotions. So that was just a real trigger for me. Yeah. It's so important. Yeah, I love that. And I want to make a distinction too. I think that, like when I think of intuition, I think of third eye area, if I'm relating it to the energy body. Okay. And when I think trust my gut, I think of solar plexus. And I make this distinction because our bodies are so intelligent. And I do think that there are different parts of our bodies that are in touch with these energies in different ways. So when I think of gut, I think of like instinct, right? There's something like you see a person right away, you know, they're dangerous, right? Like yes. that voice inside that's like cross the street. Um, to me, like that, that sort of gut feeling and intuition is, is a little bit different. But the reason I bring this up is just to say that embodiment is kind of a buzzword and embody is in the title of my book, but being really in touch with our bodies is like a way to also navigate this world in a way that is more intuitive, more instinctual, more just in touch with reality. Um, our bodies are so smart. Yes. Intelligent bodies. Yeah. That's a the concept. They are. That, 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 that it's both encouraging and a little bit frightening the first time you hear it. <laughs> if you, well, I, I mean, I don't mean it like in a, in a macabre way or something like that. I just mean that we're used to thinking about 
our society from, I guess what you might call the more masculine perspective, you know, the, okay, everything's a linear thought process and, and, you know, there, there's reason and there's rationality and logic and all that kind of thing. And, and so introducing the idea that the body is intelligent in its own way is kind of a threat to that system from one viewpoint, not in, in mm-hmm. truth, it really isn't, but from one viewpoint that there's kind of a threat going on there. Yeah. I think it could be, um, maybe I don't, I don't know if scary is the right word, but there can be a couple of resistance on a couple levels. First, chronic stress and trauma separate mm. us from our bodies. It separates mind and body. Um, when it's really bad, uh, you might not even be able to like feel your body in space, right? I've read case studies from like trauma informed yoga where veterans, like they don't, they can't like visualize or feel where their foot is if they're trying to imagine that. Mm-hmm. Um, so that stress does the same thing. It doesn't have to be like big traumas that really like we survive by like not really connecting with our bodies in a way. So that can be really hard to hear if you don't have that connection already. Right. Like I've asked clients before, uh, like yoga clients, where do you feel your stress in your body? And I've heard, I don't. Which I'm like, well, I know you have stress. You have to feel it somewhere. You're just not aware of it because you're not connected in that way just yet. It's going to take some work. So I think there's that. And then also, let's say like pain is one form of intelligence that our body has. Well, what do we do, want to do with pain in our society? We just want to treat the pain. We don't always want to treat the source, right? Mm-hmm. But being in touch with our pain, we can learn a lot about what our body needs mm-hmm. and end up treating the source. Um, I could really go on a tangent right now, but like I totally, I think, rewrote my relationship with pain through my pregnancy and birth. We did like a natural home birth and it was such an interesting experience. And I felt so in touch with that intelligence of my own body. Like it just knew what to do. And the pain was an important part of that. Um, and that's scary. We don't want to feel pain. We want to, we want to numb it out. Mm. Yeah. Well, th- um, one of the things we're not afraid of around here is rabbit holes or, or tangents as you <laughs> described. Them. So, so I, I want to encourage you to take a moment to go down that rabbit hole because that, that sounds like a really cool one. Give, give us a little bit more about what, what's on that hole. It was really interesting. Uh, first, no judgment to anyone who uses pain medication or epidurals. Um, there are all kinds of different birth scenarios. This is what I chose, and I felt very prepared for it just with all of the work I've done, uh, connecting mind, body, and spirit over the years, and and with my intuitive connection with my own daughter. I knew that this was the right road to go. And I did a lot of practice uh, and read a lot. And something I did actually was watch videos of mammals giving birth. Mm. That was um, one of the suggestions in uh, there's a, a midwife from like the seventies in a May garden. And she really like brought midwifery back into the public consciousness. And that was one of her suggestions to do like, look, this is, this is what happens every single day. We're always giving birth. This is how it happens. Your body knows what to do. It has all of the right hormones. Um, when you're allowed like the space and the safety to give birth how you need and the movement that you need, um, the pain is a teacher. It tells you how to move. It tells you what you need in the time. Um, so I really studied that hard. And then in the moment, I felt really trusting of my own body. I knew what position I wanted to be in. I knew like what noises to make. And while yes, the, the waves of, of contractions hurt, I also felt like so empowered and so alive and so like just in touch with my animal self and spirit self at the same time in a way that I hadn't before. And it was such a mind blowing experience for me. I felt like my aura just blown wide open, um, through this process and it didn't go perfectly. Actually, I had to go to the hospital afterward. Um, but the birth itself was a very beautiful experience and yeah, the pain was such a teacher. It told me what I needed. Um, a teacher of surrender to like, you have to surrender to this process that is just, on one hand, like so mundane, it happens constantly. 
And on the other hand, just so miraculous. <laughs> Once again, as you were describing that, Amory was vigorously <laughs> nodding her head up, up and down. Well, yeah, and it just sort of takes me back for when I have my when I had my first daughter. Again, I I gave birth. It was it took about like thirty hours from start to finish, and I just remembered again. I'd do that again tomorrow because it was just so amazing. But then with my second one, they actually induced me because I was a geriatric mother apparently, and um, they induced me, and it didn't feel natural, and it felt more brutal. And I was coping with it sort of like meditation and I knew something had happened to my body, but the midwife was like, kind of brought me out of meditation. I was like, no, no, you just need to do this. And I knew what was going on with my body, but they just didn't listen. And it was just a very different experience because like when you just, you know, like you said, you know, your body, it's doing what it's supposed to do. And actually, yes, it hurts, but it's a beautiful experience. Hmm. That is so interesting. First, I'm so sorry that that your second birth experience was like that. There's really nothing like having providers who have the same like belief and trust mm. in women and their bodies than we're able to cultivate like for ourselves. Um, having somebody tell you like, yeah, when to have your baby, how to position your body. Mm. They keep maybe doing like cervical checks or sweeps like that really interrupts this natural process. Is it yeah. necessary? Sometimes? Yes. Like we don't want um, tragedies and emergencies to happen and things like that, but it's just amazing. Like you knew if you would have just been left alone, <laughs> that yeah. that the experience probably would have gone very smoothly. Mm. Absolutely. Um, uh, and I hate that phrase, geriatric pregnancy. <laughs> <Ugh>. <laughs> I'm, I'm wondering where that one came from, but we'll, we'll save that one for another day. <laughs> <laughs> it's a common term over here. It's a common yeah. term. It's actually a medical really? term. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. yeah. It's interesting. And using language like that, uh, sorry, I know you said it's for another day, but using language mm -hmm. like that, it just brings me to like law of attraction, for instance, is so negative, right? Mm -hmm. um, a lot of my birth prep was doing like hypnobirthing where a lot of it was around like, neuro linguistic plant programming and, and languaging and like we don't even say contractions we say waves for instance and mm -hmm. i felt so prepared and confident in my own body because of the way i had been speaking to myself uh yeah. through the preparation and because of the emotions i allowed myself to feel around it um and i do think it it was such an impart important part of this like manifestation of this mm -hmm. birth Essentially, you're confirming, among other things, the importance of how you talk to yourself. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And this does bring me back to the sacred feminine, because in a world where we are embracing more of this concept, we would be giving mothers more space. We would be giving people more autonomy in general and trust to make their own decisions instead of feeling like we always need to be under the thumb of an authoritative figure. And our birth system uh, in the U.S., I'm sure it's the same in the U.K., is very, like, top-down, authoritative, uh, money-driven in a lot of ways. It is not what the sacred feminine is. The sacred feminine is going back to a lot of the old ways where women were supporting each other in bringing new lives through the birth portal. Um, mm -hmm. And I think, like, going back to this, like, care and respect – is such a beautiful thing that we can do yeah. again, happy for like the, the medicine and the science because it's so good in emergency situations. It saves lives, but it doesn't have to be all one way or the other. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, great point. Agreed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and a great way to uh, bring the whole conversation to a, a close here. Although there are a couple things we need to follow up on before we go any further. <laughs> Um, now, I will include in the show notes the link to the book. And once again, the book is called Embody Your Inner Goddess, A Guided Journey to Radical Wholeness. Um, but if somebody wants to either work with you or learn more about what you do, the information you put out and so forth, what's the best way to reach you? Yeah, my Instagram is great. It's I am Lauren LaDuke, L-A-U-R-E-N-L-E-D-U-C. And my website is laurenleduc.com. And both of those things should take you everywhere <laughs> you need to be to get a hold of me, to work with me. Um, I do free monthly goddess circles. 
I do one-on-one -on -one work. I do yoga teacher training. And then, of course, this book is coming out at the end of November. And it's yeah, available for the order what, now. What's the release date on that? So the release date is November 24th. Very so, exciting. Yeah, it should be in people's hands like early, very early December, because there's a little bit of time there between, right. uh, you know, ordering and distributing. But I'm so excited. Uh, and I will say, and this is for like any author that comes on your show, pre-ordering is such a great way to show your support. One, you don't forget <laughs> to order the book, but mm -hmm. two, it counts uh, toward the first week of sales and it gives algorithms yes. a little bit of a boost. So it's a really um, a kind thing <laughs> to do right. if you're planning on purchasing a book for somebody, from somebody. Yeah, and well, like I think I said, that would be a wonderful Christmas gift, don't you, Walt? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and we will put the <laughs> uh, the link into the show notes to make it easy for people to find it. So, yeah, that's great. Congratulations on on the, completing that project. By the way, I know what it's like to write a book. It's not it's not easy. There's a lot of work that goes into that. Um, so, congratulations you, on that, and obviously, best of luck with uh, the launch itself. Um, one other thing that I need to ask you about, though, um, what, not so much to ask you about, but tell you about, really. Um, because everybody who comes onto this program, one way or another, they're, they're giving to society. They've just, they, they've discovered something in their own lives and they want to share it because they realize, wow, this is really big. This is, this is great. Other people need to know about this. There are other people that this can help. And in the process of doing that, um, we do things like come on podcasts like this one, or we publish things on, you know, social media, or we write uh, blog posts, or we put stuff on YouTube, or, you know, we're, we're putting all this content out and it's being consumed many times by people we've never met, we've never seen, we never will meet, never will see. And when we kind of skip over that part, I, I say to myself, wait a minute, why, why are we skipping that? That's, that's noteworthy. That's something that's worthy of recognition. So I like to make it a practice to say on behalf of those people that you've never met and that you've never seen, that you never will meet, you never will see, who have been hearing your voice, reading your book once it comes out, uh, watching you on the podcast, listening to you on podcasts, you know, consuming the content you've been putting out there and who have been helped by what you're telling them on their behalf. Thank you for what you're doing because what you're making a difference is, is you're making a difference in people's lives. Wow. And thank you too. And I will say anyone listening to slide into my DMs, we can talk. <laughs> Not in like there a creepy way, but just in a, like a friendly way. Cause, uh, you know, it, it's, it's great hearing somebody's voice and listening to conversations. And because of this technology, we can actually like reach right out to somebody and never be afraid to, to say hi. And like, if someone's work has impacted you too, it always feels good to hear that. Oh, yeah. Um, so yeah, never be afraid to reach out. And Emery, I, I usually come to you at, at the end of these, but what's what's the one thing that's sticking out in your mind that uh, it, it just stands out more than anything else that we talked about today? I just think it, in a world where education, media and everything is trying to like program people and get people to do the same things and go to work, retire, do this. I just think it's wonderful if people like Lauren embracing your individuality the stuff about you that's different, but it's good to be different on what it brings to you and your, the planet. So embrace it. Beautiful. Well done. I love that. Lauren, thank you again. We re really appreciate you taking the time and sharing all of your, your wonderful insights into what the nature of the sacred feminine is and how we can bring it out in our lives. And wow, we can continue to do great work. Love what you're doing. Yeah. Thank you all. Thank you, Anne-Marie. It's my pleasure. Thank, thank you. you so much. And thank you to our podcast listeners everywhere. We'll see you all next time here on LOA Today. Goodbye, everybody. Mm -hmm.